Hey guys, Dave Keller here with Market Misbehavior. You know, I'm often asked about leveraged ETFs and when the market starts to roll over and uh, break down through key support, I get asked about short ETFs and leveraged short ETFs. I find these are interesting products to use if you understand the risks that are embedded in them. So today we will answer, is it a good idea to own leveraged long and short ETFs? So when the market starts to break down, you have the NASDAQ, the NASDAQ Composite, the S&P, all breaking key support levels in the, in the last week or so. I often get asked about some of the, uh, the downside uh, opportunities or the, the upside opportunities for short ETFs. You know, we've hopefully done well riding the markets higher, but the market starts to go lower. Being in, you know, in a risk off positioning, being defensive or just being in cash doesn't seem like you're benefiting enough from the downside movement in, uh, in the markets. And a lot of investors are looking to profit from that downside trajectory. And, and with short and leveraged short products, you certainly have the capability to do that. Now institutional investors have been doing that for, for a long time with options and with, ETF, uh, with uh, futures and so forth. Now with ETFs, there are really uh, effective ways that don't get into other, uh, you know, other products like, uh, like options, different structures you have to understand a lot of details with. ETFs are fairly straightforward and you, you trade them uh, similar to like you would uh, any other stock. And so it's much more accessible, I think, to a lot of investors to use ETFs to, uh, to gain that exposure. So are these effective products for you? I would say yes and no. Yes, if you understand the risks, particularly the risks embedded in the structure of those products. No, if you don't really understand the exposure that you're getting. And that's what I find with a lot of investors. They buy a leverage ETF or a short ETF. The market does one thing. Uh, the product that they're holding does something a little different than they'd expect. And that's what I would like to avoid. I don't want to buy something and have it do something unexpected, even when I understand what the market overall is, uh, is doing. Before we get to the charts, if this sort of thinking about market structure, investor behavior, technical analysis, behavioral finance is of interest to you, I hope you'll subscribe to my channel. It'd be great to have you along this ride. Also, give the video a like if you appreciate it. We'd very much appreciate that back. Put a comment below the video. Do you see further downside in the NASDAQ 100? How are you thinking of playing that uh, downside uh, potential movement? Let's get to the charts. Okay, so here we're looking at the NASDAQ 100 index, uh, you know, NDX. Uh, if you're familiar with the Qs, it's basically the underlying index on which the uh, the Qs and NASDAQ 100 ETF are basically based. And I have this purple horizontal line to illustrate what I see as this overall, you know, sort of overarching structure with the uh, NASDAQ 100 and arguably with the markets uh, as well. You have the uh, the peak around just below 14,000 here in February of 2021, hit 40, uh, 14,000 again a number of times in April of last year. Then finally in June of last year, broke above there. Didn't look back and, and made new uh, all-time highs into November. Notably, did not make a new all-time high in uh, January where the S&P actually did, actually made a new uh, closing high here as well. Then, however, you've seen the NASDAQ come back down, hit 14,000 and bounce off again. So resistance becomes support. That is a technical concept called polarity. And if you don't know what that is, I'll put a link in the description below to another video I've done on that particular concept of polarity. But now we've broken down and this week we close below, have a valid close below that support level. And what that indicates for me is further downside potential is elevated, meaning an elevated risk of much further downside in stocks. This leads me to my downside target on the S&P 500 around 3,800, which would take us uh, you know, back to uh, lows from, uh, from, from quite some time ago, from early 2021. And for the NASDAQ, I'd see a similar uh, downside movement. In general, you take the height of the pattern that you're looking at. This is around 2,500 points. You subtract that um, from the breakout level. That puts us down to around 11,500 once we get the valid breakdown, which I think we, uh, we do. That would take us back down to September and October of 2020, if you look at the chart of the NASDAQ 100. Now, again, what happens when you get this sort of breakdown is I will get people asking about short ETFs and how they can profit from the fact that the market's going lower. And it's interesting, as I mentioned in the introduction, a lot of institutions have done this sort of hedging and downside protection using futures and options and, and other derivatives and swaps and things to gain exposure like that. But what's really cool with ETFs and with leverage ETFs is you have the ability to uh, make those bets in a fairly reasonably uh, to understand uh, product. So what I'm doing now is I'm showing six ETFs. Uh, in black here, we have the uh, QQQ, the uh, the regular NASDAQ 100. This is looking at the uh, just year-to-date returns 
on these six ETFs. Then you have the double long uh, NASDAQ 100 ETF, which is QLD. And you can see all the tickers in the upper left if you want to pause it and uh, jot these down or anything. The triple uh, leveraged ETF for the NASDAQ 100 is TQQQ. And there may be some other products that do. These are the ones that I usually follow. Then we have the single short uh, NASDAQ 100 uh, PSQ. We have the double short NASDAQ 100 QID, and we have the triple short NASDAQ 100 SQQQ. So depending on what you think about the, uh, you know, the S&P 500, you then can make a leverage assessment, right? And how much, you know, if I feel much more confident in the direction I'm thinking, maybe I want to take a leveraged uh, bet and uh, and basically allow, you know, get, gain two or three times the exposure to the, the underlying index. Now, having said that, remember this black line here represents the uh, the QQQ. So it's down 17% year to date as I'm recording this uh, video. So a uh, the the long Nasdaq 100 is down 17%. So what do you think the uh, double long, the the two times uh, long ETF should be? I would imagine if the regular Nasdaq 100 is down 17%, I would imagine 17.3. I would imagine that the double long NASDAQ ETF would be down around 34%, right? 34.6% would be double the returns, but it's not. It's a little less than that. It's around 327 I would expect the uh, triple short to be three times the downside move. So if the, uh, the NASDAQ was down 17%, I would expect the triple uh, NASDAQ to be down about 51%, which is 17 times three, but it's not. It's around 46%. It's a little less than that. What you have to remember is that these products are not trying to match the return profile over time. The design of these products, they were really a, a, intended to be used for short-term traders. They were meant to get daily exposure of a certain amount. So these ETFs are meant to, you know, the QQQ has single exposure to the NASDAQ 100 index. The um, QLD should be double that daily return. So if the NASDAQ 100 is up 1%, the QL, uh, uh, sorry, QLD should be up 2%. And in orange, the TQQ, the triple Q should be up 3%, right? Simple, uh, you know, multiplying the daily returns. That's the structure of the products. And, and for the most part, they match that pretty well. But the more and more time you go on, remember, it's just stringing together the daily returns. It doesn't recalculate those returns to do some sort of long-term comparative analysis, which means if you look at a longer period, if you look year to date or for an entire one-year period, they're going to be close to double and triple the uh, long and short exposure to that index but they won't be exact. And so what happens a lot of times, my first reservation with these products is that the return profiles become disconnected, particularly over a longer period of time. In general, the longer you go, the more they will disconnect probably from uh, the underlying returns just because of how you're chaining the daily returns together. Let's look at the short ETFs, which certainly have been more profitable for the NASDAQ uh, 100 if you're betting uh, on that index uh, year to date. So the short NASDAQ ETF is up 19.2%. So while the NASDAQ is down 17%, the short NASDAQ is up 19%. So right there, you can see that disconnection where it's not, you know, the NASDAQ is down 17%, the short ETF is up 17%. It's up about 19.2%. So it's a little more than you might expect. The double uh, short ETF is up 40%. The triple short ETF is up 63%. So well above three times uh, the inverse returns year to date of the NASDAQ 100 index. So my, my first point is a lot of times people look at these and they're surprised by the long-term returns and how they don't really match the underlying index. You have to remember that is not their intention and they're not going to do that very well. Uh, and the providers of these ETFs certainly don't claim that. They claim to match the daily uh, leverage, you know, daily long or short returns to, uh, to the underlying index. The second thing I'll tell you in the reservation on have this, let's say you took the bet on the SQQQ, you went triple short the NASDAQ 100 uh, at the end of last year, right on, uh, on, on uh, December 31st, and you held it for, let's say, three, four weeks. So at this point, here in uh, you know late February, the last week in February, the NASDAQ was down around, you know, we'll call it 14, uh, 15% or so. Uh, and so an, inver a, a, uh, an inverse ETF, a, a short ETF was up uh, around a similar amount, around 15%. The triple short ETF was down about 50, 52, or was up about 50, 52%. So you're looking really good here. So when it's actually going in the direction you want and you compound those daily returns, you do incredibly well, right? So as the market keeps going downwards, overall your leveraged inverse returns look really, really good. And you're making an incredible amount of returns as that trend continues. But here's the problem. Let's say the NASDAQ has had a downward run and it just starts to turn higher a couple of days, right? So here the NASDAQ was down about 15%, uh, maybe 14%. 
and then had a nice week, right? Had about a week or so where it came higher and ended up being down around seven and a half percent. So, right, sort of halved those uh, those returns. The problem when you have leveraged inverse exposure is your positive 53% return in about a week turned into a positive 20% return. So you gave up well over half your gains and that's a huge percentage swing just from that one week of the, uh, of the, uh, the NASDAQ recovering a little bit. So my second reservation with these products is exaggerated return profiles. If you can, are you willing to accept that additional volatility? Um, you know, I've, I was often taught as an equity investor, you take on additional risk for the promise of greater returns and leverage ETFs and inverse leverage ETFs certainly exaggerate that fact. So if you can accept the fact that the volatility is going to be increased, the fact that you have much wider percent swings, and if you're sitting on a big paper profit that could be deteriorated very, very quickly, then you should take a take a shot, and or you could take a shot on these products. Otherwise, I think you're going to get very uncomfortable with the uh, with the swings that you have in here. And again, you have to be comfortable with a positive 52% return turning into a positive 20% return in just less than a week. So again, as the underlying fluctuates, the 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 ETFs, the leverage ETFs are certainly going to magnify those returns. So over time, year to date, if you were bearish on the Nasdaq and and took advantage of these uh, inverse ETFs, you'd probably be very comfortable with that. As a matter of fact, we have a paper portfolio competition on the Stock Charts TV team uh, where we produce all the content for Stock Charts TV. It's a lot of video producers and editors, not investors that uh, that are doing it. I'm currently at the top of that of the uh, of the leaderboard, mainly from owning ETFs like this. All I own are, uh, are uh, short ETFs, and I'm continuing to uh, to hold those in that paper portfolio uh, today, given I think the downside pressure uh, that we see in stocks overall. So that is an explanation of what these ETFs do. So are they a good idea? I would say yes, if you understand the risks that are involved. Number one, the risk of mismatched returns, the fact that the market can do one thing and the, uh, the ETFs could do something uh, much different, right? The returns will match up less and less as time goes on. So just be aware of that. The second one is be prepared for exaggerated returns. Elevated return possibility usually becomes with ele comes with elevated risk. That's the nature of equity investing. You're buying a company that's more risky than a treasury bond for the promise of greater returns, but you also have to shoulder that additional risk. These leverage ETFs exaggerate that issue. So be prepared for that volatility. So there we go. That's a rundown of the uh, long, double long, triple long uh, Q, uh, NASDAQ 100 ETFs, the short, double short, and triple short NASDAQ uh, ETFs as well. Many major indexes have these leverage products and inverse products. I don't think they're necessarily a bad thing. And I would say they provide, they tend to provide a relatively low way, low cost way to access particular bets that you want to make. What you just have to remember is that they were designed and are uh, intended to be used as shorter term investment vehicles. So if you're holding them for the longer term, you have to understand some of the issues that we mentioned in terms of the return profiles and the volatility that could make them behave a little differently than you might expect. With greater opportunity often comes greater risk, and you'll certainly see that in the, uh, the charts of these ETFs. If this sort of thinking about market structure, investor behavior, and technical analysis is of interest to you, I hope you'll subscribe to my channel. It'd be awesome to have you along this ride. Also, give the video a like if you appreciated it. We very much appreciate that back. Put a comment below. Which of these six ETFs would you feel most comfortable holding right now and why? Let me know in the comments below. For Market Misbehavior, I'm Dave Keller. Stay safe, be well, see ya.